you. I am thrilled to be joined by our colleagues at Temple University, uh, Jennifer, Ann, and Rick, who are going to talk about the wonderful work that they have done to learn more about the secret lives of faculty instructors and how they discover and share materials with students. I'm particularly glad to have this presentation uh, because it's a great follow-on from our October Library and the Life of the User meeting and is another example of how libraries are investing in knowing more about the communities they serve. Jennifer, Ann, and Rick will present, I think, for about 35 minutes, and then we'll use the remainder of the time to answer your questions and get your input. So please do use that chat box to ask questions as we go along, and we'll get to many, as many of your questions as we have time for. So let me just turn um, the presentation responsibilities over to Jennifer, and we'll ask our colleagues at uh, Temple to take it away. I think you need to unmute. There we go. Great. Thanks so much, Marilee. Can everyone hear me okay? You sound great. Great. Okay. So I'm Jennifer Baldwin, and I'm head of research and instructional services. I'm Ann Harlow, librarian for music, dance, and theater. I'm Rick Besseby, the reference librarian for psychology and political science. For those of you who don't know, Temple University is a large urban research university. We're state-related, and our main campus is located in the city of Philadelphia. Today, we'd like to tell you about a qualitative research project that we've been working on, exploring how and why instructors discover and share course content. Anne, Rick, and I are library liaisons working in research and instructional services. We launched this effort to learn more about the value of qualitative research for libraries and to learn more about the faculty we work with. An important part of our preparation for this project was attendance at two clear workshops offered by Nancy Foster where we were introduced to qualitative methods. We also participated in two annual research taught design and analysis workshops held at Temple University. At the beginning of the project, we initially thought we would be exploring how Blackboard is used on our campus, how faculty use it to share course content. So at the outset, we had also consulted with our colleagues in instructional technology support. Throughout our process, we tried to give back to our Temple colleagues through presentations and workshops on what we were learning through our experience, particularly on our process. We conducted hour-long structured interviews with 10 course instructors. We also tried incorporating some observation by asking instructors to show us how they found certain things, but this was not a fully realized part of the project. We scheduled time for the relevant library subject liaisons to view the recorded interviews together with the project team. If we did this again, we might do those co-viewing sessions later in the process after we'd done some analysis so that we could have guiding questions for our discussion with the other liaisons. We were influenced by grounded theory in that we decided to let the coding of the transcripts shape the direction of the project. We coded transcripts, generated new codes, coded again, and created quotes and memos using Atlas TI. Atlas TI is a qualitative data analysis software that is supported on our campus. In the next phase, we moved our analysis outside of Atlas TI, sorting the coded quotes on paper and whiteboarding our discussions to see what themes emerged. As I mentioned, we'd gone into this thinking it might reveal something about our learning management system, which is Blackboard on our campus, but that is not what emerged as particularly significant in our analysis. We asked 11 questions during the hour-long interviews. You can see those questions here. Oh, sorry about that. First, let me tell you a little bit about who we interviewed. For recruiting, we asked our library subject liaisons to identify possible participants, and we recruited from among those suggestions. Seven of the instructors we interviewed were male, and three were female. They were all full-time and either tenured or on the tenure track. And if we were to do this again, we'd be interested in having more participants at different stages of their academic career. And you can see the subject areas that those 10 instructors were working in here. So as I said, we asked 11 questions during the hour-long interviews. We asked the instructors to tell us about what they share with students, when and how they decide what to share, 
how they acquire, organize, and share it, and their expectations for what the students do with that content. Their answers about what they share and how they decide on it were usually richer, clearer, and more interesting than what we heard about their methods of organizing or distributing the content. There was minimal information about how they acquire the content itself for reasons that will become evident. In hindsight, we realized that we might have done more to prepare the participants for the interviews, perhaps prompting them to discuss examples from a single course only, and by creating more opportunities for them to discuss differences between graduate and undergraduate courses. We asked instructors to show us examples of the content they share with their classes aside from the course syllabus. Later in the interview, we asked them for examples again, this time to tell us about a specific piece of content, the very last thing they shared with the class. The things they described fell into three broad categories, published content, library-generated content, and instructor-generated content. Participants told us about some interesting content that they generated themselves in the form of a kind of mashup of published content paired with their own commentary. One example of instructor-generated content was a podcast of leitmotif. In opera, a leitmotif is a small melody that signifies a particular character or idea. The leitmotif podcast allows students to hear each melody along with an explanation of its significance by the instructor. Another example of instructor-generated content was a video of images from Grove Art Online and Art Store narrated by the instructor. These questions also yielded two examples of library-created content, an assignment designed with a liaison librarian and library research guides. The instructors described many examples of published materials that they shared. We'll mention just a few of these as including traditional print textbooks, as well as library e-resources used in lieu of books, PDFs of published articles, clips from feature films, cartoons, library video databases, and television, photocopied entries from a companion guidebook, a Wikipedia article saved as a PDF, scans of book chapters, and a DVD from the library media collection. In question two, we asked instructors to describe how they make decisions about what to share with students. This was difficult for them to answer because it required them to probe their tacit knowledge. In question four, we compelled them to remember and describe a specific example, revealing more explicitly their behaviors and criteria for identifying and sharing content with students. Instructors had a hard time describing how they decided or what to share with the students. Often they said, I just know. When prompted to explain further, some said that they didn't ever really look for course materials, but rather that they just knew of certain items when they needed to. The state of just knowing, of tapping into their abundance of tacit knowledge, is tantamount to their job description as professors. One instructor said, well, that's my job to know. I'm always aware of things, so if it appears to me, I'm going to see it. It isn't a new revelation that experts and scholars think this way, but it's a good reminder that when they share content with students, teaching faculty may reveal to students what they know, but not necessarily how they came to know it. Embedded in this quote here is a statement about the scholars' immersion in and attention to the content-rich environments that are essential to becoming knowledgeable. How can academic libraries and publishers influence what appears to them in that content-rich environment? And how can we encourage instructors to reflect upon a model for students this kind of attentive immersion? When pressed to elaborate on how they decide, the instructors describe two directions for their attention, inward toward their community of experts, and outward toward life as lived by someone attuned to certain content. These are not mutually exclusive camps. Both of these ways of looking at the world are made tangible, if not explicit, in the examples of what they share with their students. For the inward direction, the behaviors they described included chasing citations and consulting the must-know works, consulting with colleagues, accumulating over time a physical or mental repository of reputable, reputable known items to pull from, 
The instructor's expertise grants them access to a community of peers who are extremely attuned and to the scholarly communication channels particular to their field. One of the participants described this as the cocktail partner, saying, you're kind of just keeping tabs on who the big people are and what they're saying and who they, they're citing. It's kind of a cocktail party, you know. A social network is a little bit less cumbersome than doing a keyword search in a database. And another described it as having smart friends. She said, look, I want my friends to be smarter than me, and I just got a lot of really good help. So the first time I ever taught this course, I wrote my friend who has been a professor a couple more years than I had been, and I said, you know what, what do you use? When discovering content from this vantage point, instructors relied on reputation and attribution. In this respect, a canon is applied to students. This is what students must know, and the examples included colleague-recommended textbooks with the best content coverage for undergraduates, and the widely accepted must-know readings for graduate students. On the other hand, some instructors we interviewed spent more time describing the outward orientation, the content they, use, they share with students appearing to them in their daily life, from popular culture and in current events. They are tuned in and picking up on things like infographics, cartoons, blog posts, images, and video content that connects with immediacy to the course content as they teach it. These outward-looking behaviors included regular reading popular press, print and online newspaper and magazine subscriptions, or alerts from the corresponding websites, making the connections between their personal or leisure reading selections in their area of expertise, browsing in bookstores and library collections via the book stacks, reshelves area, and the online new books list, and discovering in their environment in popular culture and in current events the last-minute additions that disrupt planned course readings. Here we see an instructor describing seeing potential course content serendipitously while going about his daily life and while reading to his children. It was in this thread of the interview discussions where we also heard the expected stories about serendipitous discovery in the library stacks. For some of these instructors, the library stacks are still a sensible place to discover new content, even when in competition with the universe of digital content. These scholars describe feeling as if new, interesting books actually reveal themselves from within the shelves. One instructor described with considerable surprise finding a book connected to her research area even though she intentionally went to browse the relevant section of the stacks. A part of the affect of this kind of experience is that it can seem organic or even uncanny. That instructor also described how having crazy interests is a part of becoming knowledgeable, saying shouldn't that be what a professor is? Instructors want to share their own enthusiasm for seeing their subject content in the world at large. Being interested, engaged, and curious like they are is what they hope for from their best students. Course instructors operationalize their tacit knowledge in this way because they can. But as we just saw, this kind of serendipity isn't really all that serendipitous. They already are attuned to the relevant content in the world and to a large degree imagine that they embody the content within themselves. That's the title of our presentation, I Am the Content. Now, instructors sometimes wish students would browse the stacks the way they do. Students cannot replicate this kind of behavior organically for their coursework. Because search is of little value to instructors, they tend not to model it for their students. And because of how they employ their tacit knowledge and their scholarly networks, course instructors aren't particularly burdened by information overload. These findings raise interesting questions with implications for library instruction as well as discovery. Is discovery something that can be modeled and practiced? Can creative use of search and discovery tools be a means of helping students to try on this way of seeing the world? What is the role of the library in bridging this gap, making the invisible visible, and encouraging reflective practice in teaching? Our questions about how instructors organize the content they share with students yielded responses that varied from individual to individual, 
depending on their work habits. However, there were two commonalities. First, that their process is perpetual. And second, that unbundled content would be easier for them to manage. Answers to these questions revealed a perpetual cycle of gathering and inserting content, and that content additions and changes were largely unpredictable. The interviews did not reveal the kind of emphasis on semester timelines that we might have expected, whether the individual instructor tended to plan ahead or not. The fact that new courses accrue content as they go means that library liaisons may want to target new courses while they are being taught for the first time. Because established courses receive only tweaks and timely changes, librarians may want to think about how to alert those course instructors to updated content when there are C changes in the field or when there are significant changes to the kinds of students enrolled in these courses. The prevalence of on-the-fly additions based on instructors' own current consumption means it is advantageous for librarians and content providers to know more about what instructors read and to push current events-related content on the same day or week it connects with external current events. The instructors all described more than one way that they organized the content they find, and most had some difficulty finding the examples they were telling us about, whether it was looking in paper files on their desk, in folder trees on their computer, or using a web-based service. The silos and containers used for storing and organizing content are not particularly well suited for how these instructors work. Their descriptions revealed an ongoing struggle to find a good way to keep track of things. In the example of the publicly accessible Google site, the instructor simply made the site serve as both his own archive as well as the means of sharing with students across all his classes. In his view, it was advantageous for him to have it all in one place and also good for students to see the full spectrum of content he teaches in case they wanted to delve beyond the assigned readings. Because we are a Blackboard campus, we were expecting to hear more about how Blackboard is used to deliver content to students. However, the primary function of Blackboard that was discussed in the interviews was as an email distribution list. Some instructors arranged content in Blackboard by semester, week, or thematic areas but the practices were inconsistent even within a single class, and what was shared on the course site itself was incomplete. When online, direct emails of content through the system seemed to be the preferred way to share the most valued content with students. In the classroom, paper is privileged, reserved for the most important content. The library's course reserve services were infrequently mentioned in the interviews. The interviews predated our transition to using ARIES to integrate course reserves into Blackboard, so that may be a factor in some of the instructor comments. When course reserves were mentioned, it was often as an aside. The instructors would state that they were aware of the service, but that they make only occasional use of it for some items. The instructors noted that course reserves were cumbersome to request and set up, requiring advanced planning. Some instructors also mentioned course reserves as difficult for students to retrieve. Our observation is that the course reserves process, whether self-service in Blackboard or done through library request forms, does not reflect well the instructor's view of their own seemingly organic discovery of content to share. We asked course instructors to tell us what they expected as an outcome from sharing this content. We also asked how much of it was required reading and how much time they thought students spent on it. What emerged from the interviews was that reading has an ongoing importance and value and that reading itself is being taught and modeled by course instructors. We also learned that despite the tremendous effort that goes into gathering and sharing course readings, the instructors we interviewed have very low expectations for how much of a student 
students do read. This is not a new problem. The course instructors we interviewed expect students to read in order to understand conventions, learn the core material, engage with illustrative examples, and experience growth through exposure. Instructors described several kinds of activities that encourage students to read more effectively. These included reading together, guiding students through highlighting and underlining, completing fill-in-the-blank worksheets, and providing reading guides that point students toward the critical content and arguments in a text. I'm going to read this quote in full for you because it gives a good sense of the kind of interview material we got to work with. It's a fairly typical in terms of length. It is also a good illustration of a professor trying to grapple with fathoming what students know and what skills they need to develop. I handed out the first four pages of this article and asked them to read it and answer a set of questions on the first four pages about how research has been done on this topic. I think it just required very close reading. I mean, actually, it was fairly easy. It wasn't hard to do, but it did require going through the reading and underlining. I actually explained to them how to underline. Unbelievable. To look for the content, the question was asking specifically. But most of them got A's and B's, so they did it. I just think they found it too particular. Most course instructors admitted that they have no real way of knowing just how much students are reading, but their expectations were very low relative to the amount of content they supplied to students. However, the instructors described being able to ascertain how much a student had read based on their performances on reflection essays, quizzes, and question sets. These expectations surrounding reading have some implications for library instruction, outreach, and programming. Libraries can be leaders on campus about the ways in which reading may or may not be changing as a result of screen reading, digital content, social networks, and so forth. Critical reading can be better incorporated as an integral part of information literacy instruction. We can provide library instruction to those courses that often frustrate librarians, those that do not include research assignments but demand students work from close readings of provided text. We can talk about reading citations, abstracts, results pages as a kind of genre. We can offer programming around the topic of reading, not just for enrichment or leisure, but as an inherent part of scholarship. So a quick recap on the behaviors behind instructors' choice of content to share with students. Course instructors choose content based on their habits and ways of seeing, whether it is the inward network of colleagues and known items, or from their outward sensitivity to relevant content in popular culture and the world at large. Academic content providers need to find more ways to put relevant content in front of course instructors at the right time. These instructors are relying more and more on popular online press sources. And the content pushed to them must meet the criteria they are looking for in order for them to share it with their students. Our findings suggest that we can do more with open and alternative educational resources. And in order to help instructors create their mashups and capture students' attention, we might put forward more unbundled content rather than promoting whole articles and books. The quality of the content matters, but for undergraduate courses, much of the content must be quickly digestible, illustrative, and impactful. Our interviews revealed a number of technological challenges that influence the content instructors share with students. The content pieces are tied up in their holes and competing platforms create silos. Many of the tools intended to help them don't do what they really need. How can we improve learning management systems in ways that help instructors better manage the content they want to share? And where is the share with my class button for our expensive academic content subscriptions. Library liaisons are often well situated to influence instructors' decisions, possibly by curating and disseminating the most interesting and impactful content for teaching. An implication from our interviews is that pushed content works. For example, we were surprised to hear from the instructors how very often our emailed new books lists influence their decisions. Another thing liaisons can do 
is to more explicitly address the appropriate course level for some content, as well as to remain aware of all the criteria that matter most to instructors in their particular subject area. Participation in qualitative research projects like this one can be time consuming, but it is an excellent way for liaisons to develop a much deeper understanding of the instructors they work with and influence and enrich the spectrum of academic content that is shared with students. So throughout this discussion and overview of our findings, we've tried to mention implications for various areas of our work in libraries, including library instruction, liaison outreach, open educational resources, discovery systems, and learning management systems. I think we have plenty of time now for your questions, um, but this is a still work in progress as in keeping with the spirit of the webinar, um, so we're hoping to get your thoughts as well on a few questions that we have here for you, too. So thank you. Thank you, Temple colleagues, very much. Um, I don't see any questions from our participants yet, uh, so we'll go ahead and give them a little bit of time to, um, to type in. Uh, I love the questions that you've left for them, so particularly uh, seeing which of the findings uh, seem mo most fruitful for further investigation. Um, and how much does this resonate uh, with what others are experiencing or learning on their campuses. Um, I'd also be interested in hearing um, from participants uh, if they're doing um, if they're doing or planning similar work, if they could describe some of that um, for us. Um, one of the uh, questions that I had for you, we'll, we'll just give people a couple minutes and see if anybody uh, has any comments for us, is uh, what have you thought that you could do specifically about um, unbundling comment content? You, you mentioned uh, a couple of times that um, instructors find it easier to deal with content that's unbundled. Uh, are there things that are within your control that you could do to uh, present content that is more unbundled for your instructors? Well, um, one of the things that I know I've been thinking about is um, excerpting paragraphs, um, particularly from works that we consider to be more like reference works, um, because we saw a lot of those being used as textbooks. Um, so when communicating, say, during the preparation for a library instruction session, and you know a thing or two about what that instructor tends to do each semester with that class, excerpting, you know, just a chapter or even a page from a recent book that I think might be a good fit for the class is more effective than simply sending, or I'm guessing it could be more effective than simply sending a link to the catalog record for the book or suggesting the book as a whole. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, Shane from uh, University of Minnesota uh, has a question for you. Um, at Minnesota, we are interested in figuring out how faculty discover course material. Would you say that in your research you found that faculty typically use the library to find known content, or did they say they use library search tools to discover new content? My impression is that they use their social networks more than anything. Yeah, I, we definitely found, um, as we said, sort of two directions. So looking towards their scholarly network, their network of colleagues for known items. And those known items tended to be, uh, you know, work communicated by word of mouth. Um, and then also looking outward to popular culture. Very few of them actually talked about using any of the library's search tools unless they really just needed to retrieve or acquire a specific known item and they didn't already have it in paper or didn't have it emailed to them some other way. Yeah, once I, I was explaining a database to a professor um, and showing him all the features of it and he said, well, that's great, but if it's important, I'm going to hear about it. Um, so I don't really need this. In contrast to that, though, we did hear about instructors um, browsing the shelves in the library and um, 
finding uh, and looking and using the new books list. So it's not that they're, they are using the library and they're using the library services, but just not the search services. Right, so they're pretty omnivorous in terms of their um, discovery of, of materials and, and, and you, you, you talked about how the, you know, quote serendipity plays, in, plays into that, um, which I thought was very interesting. The, un, the, the, the unsurprising unserendipitousness uh, of it all. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Shane, for your question. Uh, if others have questions, we'd love to see them. Uh, I had a question for you guys about um, popular uh, content or um, kind of like timely news. So, for example, I've, I've created a, a Twitter feed that's all of the um, Twitter accounts from libraries in the OCLC Research Library Partnership. And I've been really interested to see how much those reflect uh, kind of pointers to things about popular culture. So, for example, yesterday was all about David Bowie, of course, um, and so wondering uh, how much of that content you're thinking about pushing towards um, faculty, or do you think that they have their own channels for, for finding that sort of uh, stuff that would relate uh, to very popular content? I think that's one of the biggest challenges, um, is getting your channel that you're curating to be a part of their regular consumption. Um, so, I mean, it's got to have what, they, what they're looking for in it, or it's at least got to resonate with them somehow. But I also, I, I feel like I heard in the interviews just a tendency to go with what puts itself in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how you negotiate that from one individual to another it depends a lot on understanding their work habits, frankly. Right. Here's another question from, from Allison, um, who says, has the realization that faculty don't use search themselves but rely on serendipity, in quotes, or social networks changed your outreach to faculty or instructor instruction practices as liaison librarians? Um, so, let's see, so don't use search themselves but rely on serendipity or social, right, so how has it changed instruction practices? It, it's well, changed my really. way of yeah. It's changed my way of marketing these things. To back to saying that this kind of takes the place of let's say searching in a database takes the place of, of using an expert. Um, you're going to use uh, more advanced features like how people cite things rather than how just using it as a, as a, a full um, phone search of it. You want to see how all these things connect the way the same way faculty talk to each other uh, by by using the citation patterns. And it's certainly um, influenced, even to a greater extent than I already was, um, my treatment of sort of popular press and popular culture as an equally rich um, resource for engaging students with whatever the course content is. Um, I tend to really avoid, in my subject areas, avoid making strong distinctions between the academic and uh, the popular, um, in part reflecting what I've seen those course instructors, what their preferences are. Yeah, I think that that's, a, that's an, important, an important thing is that the, the instructors are modeling behavior that you can also adopt. Um, Rita from University of Toronto asks, related to this, how has your research resonated with your own liaison librarians? These revelations seem to me to be quite a challenge to our intra-library notions of the power of search and the use of search by our faculty. Right, right. Um, I think library instruction in particular, because that's where we see the um, maybe attachment to teaching and demonstrating search um, maybe most strongly, um, is definitely moving. Um, if you consider, for example, the ACRL framework, it is moving to speaking about library instruction in a way that's much more nuanced than talking about search alone. Um, in particular, really embracing teaching an entire process 
of exploration as a part of library instruction and not thinking that, hey, we can't talk about critical reading, hey, we can't talk about what it is to struggle with topic formulation. We're really here, I think, as liaisons trying to integrate all of that into our understanding of what library instruction is. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll give people another chance, another pause here to um, to type in uh, their question. But I wanted to ask about uh, the changes that are coming in um, course reserves. So you're using Aries, I think you said to uh, to manage course reserves. Do you think that you would um, do a, a, a light follow up at some point to see if uh, your changes in how course reserves are managed uh, are having an impact on this, um, on your uh, teaching faculty? Possibly. We've uh, got a couple of years now under our belt of using ARIES since we first started this project. Um, mm -hmm. So we could certainly um, take a look at use there. Uh, you know, the course reserve side of this was pretty interesting. Um, how it seemed to be talked about was reluctantly and often framed within a tentative mention of copyright. To me, anyway, a lot of our interviewees seem to be saying, well, and I do put one or two things on reserve, you know, in case of copyright. <laughs> and then everything else kind of is done the way that works best for them. Um, and I think, you know, so they're, they're giving a nod there. They know it's an issue, but you know, course reserves isn't necessarily the answer for them to that issue. Right. I wanted to mention I too, yeah, if, uh, go ahead. if I could, um, just engaging our library liaisons in those co-viewing sessions. Um, you know, if we, as I had said, if we were to do that part over again, we might have pushed it later in the process because I think there's a lot to digest in listening to an hour-long interview, and I think it was only after we did our analysis, the project team did our analysis, that we might have come up with better guiding questions for the library liaisons. Um, we certainly got a nice little list of practical ideas from each liaison about things they said they would do differently um, or might consider differently from having listened to these interviews. But I think that could have been even richer had we um, structured those co-viewing sessions a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about, about your process and about how the different um, library liaisons were engaged in this? So you had, a, you had a core research team and then were all uh, liaison librarians um, Engaged in the in the in this research, and in what way? Yeah, so um, it was just the team of the three of us, um, and naturally we communicated communicated with our colleagues about what we were up to throughout the process. But the liaisons who attended the co-viewing sessions tended to be those working directly with that course instructor. Um, there were a couple of occasions where we invited in another liaison who had some kind of connection. So I can think of an example where our media librarian was invited to a couple of them to hear more about the media use that goes on in some of those interviews. Um, yeah. Um, we also did uh, one or two presentations to our academic assembly of librarians, um, and we also had an invitation out to a number of liaisons um, one semester who came and did basically interviewing workshops where we talked about what we had learned about the interviewing process itself, developing good questions and conducting interviews. Great. Um, I'm not seeing questions for participants, so I'm going to give people kind of like a final warning here and ask uh, just maybe maybe one or two more questions um, of you guys, and then we'll, we can let everybody go early if there's no questions. But uh, if there are burning questions, we would love to see them. And I'd love um, so to see what, any responses to our questions as well, if anybody has comments on those. Yeah, that would be, that would certainly be great. Um, so I was going to uh, ask what, what do you think, um, which of these uh, themes uh, are you 
or findings do you think you'll um, you'll be tackling first? Yeah, I think we're thinking about that. Um, and it may be that each one of us has a different section that we pursue. I've been thinking recently a lot about the critical reading component um, and also um, compliance with course readings. There's some literature out there from over the decades uh, about the degree to which students actually read assigned material. Um, and I'm kind of interested in whether or not there are any changes in that uh, recently. I, I, it's, it's influenced me in the way I, um, I'm teaching undergraduates, particularly the reading aspect too, um, both reading search results and actually reading for content even in popular press, seeing how, how experts get used in it and how that sort of models what it actually goes in um, scholarly communication as well. Um, and, and following up on those kind of things. So that's been really interesting, and I think that's been really helpful in terms of bridging that gap between the, 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 kind, the forms of writing and the way students actually are beginning to read things and sort of a burst of attention span. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm also just really interested in maybe uh, honing best practices for liaison outreach based on some of this um, and really tying uh, practical actions to some of these findings for our liaisons. When, when you develop those, go, go ahead. One implication that um, concerns me a lot is about the nature of scholarship itself in our new digital environment that we have now with search capabilities, we have the ability to go beyond disciplinary walls and silos. And um, it concerns me that we, what we saw with faculty, I mean, I'm glad that they're going beyond academia to share content into the real world and making this really relevant to students and, and more interesting by using the popular press. But when they uh, are using, when they go inward and they're using their colleagues and who they know, and we saw this over and over again, it concerns me that the nature of scholarship is, uh, is still insular and, and not really taking advantage of um, what now we can do in exploration with digital content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't see any questions uh, from our uh, participants, I think you had one last slide. Oh, sure. I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to uh, weigh in on our findings. My contact information is on there, so if you have any questions or follow-up comments on this project, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, I'll make sure all three of us see anything that you sent. So thanks a lot.